So I'll introduce myself, followed by Barak, and then we'll get started. So okay. I'm Shreya Garwal, having more than more than decades of experience in AI and related areas. I have I'm based out of London. Uh, I'm based out of London and work for consulting firms. I'm also Microsoft MVP in AI. I'm also author of a book called Responsible AI, published by Springer. Uh, I have I'm very active blogger and speaker in multiple forums. I'm also part of United Nations and as an expert in AI. Yeah, that's all about me. And you can find me on LinkedIn and everywhere, everywhere else. Um, now I'll hand over to Baraka to introduce herself, herself and get started. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Baraka. I'm not as accomplished as Shrey. Um, I'm a financial engineering student based in Kenya, and I'm also a Microsoft student ambassador from Strathmore University, and I'm very excited to be doing this live session with all of you. Okay. So in case you want to follow whatever it is that we're going to do during this session, you can click on or follow this link here, aka.ms land live slash whatever is here, 2022-0916A. And I'll also introduce our moderator today, that is Bethany Jepchumba. She will be with you in the chat, answering your questions uh, before we can get to them towards the end of the session. So once again, if you want to follow, please um, go to the link that is here at the top of the screen, that is aka.ms slash landlive hyphen 2022-0916A. So Sri, um, our objectives today are to tell the people when to use classification, how to train different models by using um, the Teddy models framework that's in R and how to evaluate these models. So we're going to divide this session into two. We're going to deal with a binary model as well as a multi-class classification model. But before we get into that, I'll let Sri introduce us to classification what it's all about, whatever he has to say about it, and then we can go straight into coding. Interesting. Thank you so much, Baraka. So when it comes to classification in simple word, classification words from the uh, comes from the word classify, and it talks about taking a machine learning algorithm to learn uh, a set of to learn from a set of data that will the object fall into class A or class B. So for example, if you have a basket of fruits and it has oranges and apple, and if I try to, if I ask you to classify fruits into either oranges and apple, you see some features, the color of the fruit, the softness of the fruit, the size of the fruit, the smell and the texture and the taste. So using smell, texture, taste, color, and size, you will say that, hey, this is orange. And this is apple. Now, why are you able to do that? Because you have seen that fruit a lot of times in your life. So if I even if I blindfold you, give you orange and give you apple, there's a very high probability that you will be able to classify the fruits into the right category. And because and you are able to do because you have your mind has been trained on oranges and apple, or rather, what is oranges and what is apple for infinite times. And using that very learning, even if I blindfold you, you'll be able to classify oranges in, and apples into separate categories. And that is what classification is all about. We, we first tell the machine that these are the features, which are like anything, which can be thousands, millions and millions. These are the features. And this feature build this particular object. And then, once and we give millions of examples of hundreds of examples to that machine and then we when we just pass on the feature machine would be able to tell you what is that object so good so examples are like good customer bad customer um, cats or dog when it comes to images when it comes to transaction fraudulent transaction or legit transactions and so on and so forth 
Yeah, Barak, if you want to add something or you can continue, please. Yeah, we can continue. Yeah, so, so go ahead, sorry. So this is just another simple example. Um, we're trying to use blood glucose to classify whether someone is diabetic or non-diabetic, just as, as Sri has explained very nicely. We're basically just trying to categorize that data based on some features that we already have. And Sri, would you like to continue? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> in simple terms, it talks about uh, what level of uh, blood glucose you will have as a tool, what level of blood, blood glucose you will have to classify the, your diabetic or not. So right now we'll, we'll take up an example and we will train and evaluate a classification model wherein we will be predicting that a person is diabetic or not. Uh, so this example is for diabetic. There are similar examples for breast cancers and tuberculosis and red, uh, eye problem and so on and so forth. But here is a simple example that a person will have this medical data and will try to understand is that person diabetic or not given a very, very small data set. And again, this is an illustrative example. I mean, when you do it in real life, you will need much more information, much more data points to predict a person is diabetic or not. So um, before we go into that, because now we're going to be doing either zero or one, is a person diabetic or is a person not diabetic? We're going to use a logistic regression, which is, um, it's more of a sophisticated binary response model. So basically it uses logarithms and it's, it gives us the log of odds of an event happening. So the, the odds ratio, which is the probability of success over the probability of failure, maybe you can say the probability of someone being diabetic uh, versus the probability of someone being non-diabetic. Um, so now the logistic regression gives us the log of that, the log of the odds ratio. And basically it gives us a non-linear relationship because if we look at a simple linear relationship where we can say, let's say y, a variable y is equals to 2x, that cannot happen when we're dealing with um, binary responses. So when we're dealing with zero and one, whether someone will default or not. So we have to create a relationship that is non-linear for us to be able to predict an event happening. So uh, we'll take us to the Microsoft Learn module. We will go through one example. However, we will leave a part for the rest of you uh, guys to just try and do the examples by yourself because we won't do everything for you. And, you know, just to give you an incentive to go and learn how you can do this differently and you can give us feedback on how you would approach the problem in case we've, you know, we've approached it in a different way than you would have. So as I said, this is in the LAN module, um, and the LAN module is Introduction to Classification Models by using RNTID models. It's part of a bigger LAN path, which is create machine learning models with RNTID models. But today we'll focus on this one, classification models. And the first thing we'll do is to train and evaluate a binary classification model. Just as Sri had mentioned, we're going to be dealing with um, data or diabetes, so trying to predict whether someone is diabetic or not, and we'll do that in a few steps. So first step is always to load, load your data into wherever it is you're working, so your environment. So in this case, we're going to load and import a CSV file into a table, which is just basically like a data frame, your modern data frame. And then, so we're going to import the data, and then we're going to clean it, and then we're going to split it. So splitting is important because we're trying to do an out of sample prediction. Uh, if we do an in sample prediction, let's say we use our whole data to train the model and still test the model, it is very possible that we can overfit our model. So we could get 
accuracy of maybe even 100 percent but that will not be realistic because if we go uh, to the real world and we're trying to predict something in the real world it's highly likely that the data you're trying to predict was probably not in the features or within the training uh, model so what we'll do is we'll split our data uh, into a certain percentage maybe 70 percent 30 percent so 70 for training and then we test it on 30 percent and then we see and evaluate how well our model will work at predicting whether someone is diabetic or not. And um, as we, sa we said in the heading, we're doing this using tidy models. So we're going to load our tidyverse uh, library and then we read our data. So here it is, we've named it diabetes. So we're reading the CSV file and then we can view it. We can view the head of our data just to have a glimpse of how the data looks and this is our data here that has been loaded into the table so we have patient id pregnancies um, plasma glucose diastolic blood pressure triceps thickness serum insulin bmi diabetes pedigree age and then we finally have whether someone is diabetic or not as you can see this is zero or one as we were talking about binary so zero represents whether someone is non-diabetic and then one represents a diabetic person just as Sri had mentioned we are using some medical data to try and predict whether this person is diabetic or not but we happen to have our patient id column now our patient id column is it gives a unique id to our, our instances and when training a model having a unique id will also lead to overfitting so while we're cleaning our data for us to have the final data to train, uh, to split and then train, we're going to be dropping the patient ID column just so we can remain with the rest of the features as well as the, the diabetic column. And then we're going to encode this just for the purposes of training and fitting the model. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll add something here. So this is historical data in sense, yeah. as I told, we need to train um, the machine on something which we know the answer so the machine would try to build a relationship between uh, the pregnancy status the glucose plasma blood pressure triceps th thickness bmi and insulin level and try to see if this is how the pattern is is a person diabetic or not and in that case patient id does not matter even if you change my id or if, even if I have ID which is like 001 or 007, it does not matter. What matters is the the, the other four or five or six uh, features which will allow the machine to create a pattern that if this happens, the probability of somebody having diabetic is high or low. That is true or false or positive or negative. Is Perka, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. So um, we can get a glimpse of our data just once again we are uh, and just seeing um, our features so we have the patient id once again and all these features as well as the types of data you can see most of it is numeric um, we have some floats here and so uh, we can now go ahead to clean our data so as i mentioned we're going to drop the patient id column to prevent us from overfitting and we're also going to encode the diabetes um, column as a category so that is basically what we're doing here and we're going to use the library janitor r has a lot of libraries and a lot of packages that make your work easier so just consider looking into all the developments that are going into making using r quite simple for you i'm just going to run that cell and then so now you see we have our diabetic column has now become a factor, factor of zero and one. The rest have remained the same and we don't have the patient ID column anymore. So the next thing now we're going to do is we're trying to understand the relationships between our data attributes. So we have all these columns. So what we're going to do is just try and understand if there's some correlation between um, this data uh, we can try and see the distribution of the data. Just, you know, the steps uh, when you're analyzing data, you have to... Um, 
what uh, what is it just go through the data basically uh, explore the data the word i'm looking for is explore the data so data exploration so first we'll uh, please uh, pivot the data to a long format as this and then now we're going to plot so we're going to plot box plots just so we can see the distribution of the data and here as you can see um i'm not sure if it's very clear let me try and zoom in so as you can see we have our age variable bmi diabetes pedigree diastolic blood pressure plasma glucose pregnancies serum insulin and triceps thickness so these are just box plots they show us the distribution um and one as we said is for diabetic people and zero is for non-diabetic people so we're just seeing uh, the relationship between each variable and our y variable which is whatever it is that we're trying to predict um yeah that's just basically giving us a visualization this is one way for you to explore data you can get a correlation table if you'd like you can do the many things that you would like to do when exploring the data um, this is just a small in introduction as we said this is illustrative so we're just going to do the box plots just for you to see and yes this middle line here represents the median yeah and the box plot just gives us um quartile so it gives us distribution in in terms of quartiles so you can look at the interquartile range you can look at the lower quartile and then the highest quartile whatever it is that you'd like to learn from the box plot it's a really really good statistical distribution of visualization so yeah that was just just for us to see and then so now we're going deep into it so we're going to split our data and what we're going to do is load our library which is tidy models and then we set the seed so the reason we're setting seed is so that even when you do it in case you're following along with us you can produce the same results that we produce when we're doing it um yeah it's just for reproducibility that's why we're setting seed and then we're splitting our data into 70 percent for training and 30 percent for testing so here's the code that is doing that so we're doing an initial split um 70 percent for training and then we'll call a new variable known as diabetes train um and then that's our training data set and then diabetes test will be our testing data set and then we can print the number of classes in each split in case you'd like and we can also just view the data to see the head of the training data so let me just um, zoom out a bit so our training cases are 10,500 and our test cases are 4,500 as Sri mentioned these are just um a small example this isn't very big data sometimes you can be working with millions of rules like big data so but this is just for example purposes just as an introduction so this is our training um, data set we are being the head of it so those are the first five rules as you can see um, that's how it looks and then now we're going to train it straight yeah absolutely thank you so much um, so the main purpose of training and testing is as simple. So if you sit in a classroom and you're learning something, that's training. And how do you know that you have you've learned properly? Is you take uh, exercise and try to solve it yourself and see the answer in the exercise that does, does your solution matches the right answer or not. That's what is testing. So... Uh, training and testing are from the both are from the same universe. Testing, we tell the machine the patterns and the right answer that is a person diabetic or not, all the details, and the machine gets tra trained. Once it gets trained to test how good has the training been, uh, to evaluate what has been the accuracy of the training, how effective is the training, we just give the features and ask the machine a question, tell me. Is that instance or is that person diabetic or not? And machine will give you a reply. And if that reply matches the right reply, we give, give him the full marks or else we do not give him the full marks. And that is how we'll try to evaluate uh, the effectiveness or performance of the model which we have trained. 
first train it on a data tell it the right answer let it learn the pattern and next just give it the features uh, using what it has learned using the training data it will tell me or predict predict that is that person diabetic or not and thus we will evaluate how good is the training if the training is not been good either we retrain change the data change the algorithm or do something so that the training gets better and you get a better result it's a similar thing like a human being you sit in a class you learn from your professors and teachers go back home do a solved example to see that your answer matches the answer in the book if yes you are trained properly if not you go back learn again and keep repeating it till you do not achieve a good amount of accuracy uh, given the standard accuracy of your peers or a benchmark which you have set thank you sri so now as i mentioned earlier we're going to use a logistic regression so uh, basically this is what we are doing here logistic uh, regression then we are setting engine as glm this stands for generalized linear model and then we are setting the mode as classification which is what we are trying to accomplish here and then we can print out the model specification as below so the computational engine is generalized linear model G, uh, glm so now the next step is now using this our specification to train our model so we're going to call our model um, log reg fits or logistic regression fit. And then we're going to fit it on our data. So this uh, is our Y variable, whatever it is that we're trying to predict that is diabetic. And then we're using all the features in our data set to predict it. Sometimes you may not want to use all the features so you can specify whatever features you would like to use here instead of this full stop. But here we're using all the features so we're just going to use it's a simple it's shorthand so we're going to use that simple dot and then we're going to specify that that our data is our training data set and then we're going to print the model object and this is what we have so we have our coefficients we have our intercept we have pregnancies plasma glucose all of that now as i mentioned earlier our logistic regression um, it gives us the log of odds and the reason we're using logarithm uh, while doing this binary sort of prediction is because the logarithm will restrict it between zero and one. Our, our output will be restricted between zero and one. So as you can see here, aside from the intercept, all the coefficients are between zero and one. So it's 0 0.266, 0 0.009, 0 0.012, 0 0.022, and so on and so forth. So our negative here, that is before our coefficients, just shows that they have a negative relationship with the y variable. So basically, if we increase the pregnancies by one unit of, let's say, a patient, then it is highly likely, like the log of, or the likelihood of them having diabetes reduces by 0 0.266296 so that's the purpose of the negative here it's showing us that they have an inverse relationship with our y which is a variable we're trying to predict and in this case it is diabetes so how we interpret these coefficients is what is their relationship what what is the likelihood of our y variable increasing or decreasing given a unit increase of our features so that is what is here, that's our coefficients. And then we also have our degrees of freedom and uh, anything else and the AIC. Uh, we won't go into that because that's more uh, econometrics and, and yeah. So now what we'll do is we'll make predictions. As I mentioned earlier, we divided our data into training and testing data set. Now, as Sri mentioned, and, and as he's explained, we're trying to see how well does our model do in predicting um, data that is not within the training data set. So we're going to, pre uh, to predict, now we're using our diabetes test, and then we're selecting our uh, Y variable that is diabetic. 
and then we're basically just trying to predict if if someone is diabetic or not, and this is our output. So we see originally from our test set, this is our test set, um, this is our test set data that is diabetic, and then this is what is predicted. So we can see uh, zero, zero, so someone who was non-diabetic, let's call them patient X, was non-diabetic, and our model predicted that they were really non-diabetic based on whatever information we had given our model. However, we can also look here, we have someone who was diabetic, but our model predicted that they were non-diabetic. So how can we evaluate how well our model did in predicting whether someone is diabetic or non-diabetic? Um, we can use accuracy. So we can just try and see how accurate was our model in prediction. Um, we can run that. So we'll just do accuracy. Uh, we'll use accuracy, then we'll put our data now will be our results, which we saved here as results when predicting, and then our truth is the diabetic now from the test set, and then our estimate is whatever we had predicted. And our accuracy comes to 0 0.78, which is around 78.89%, which is not, not so bad. It didn't do so bad, but I'm sure that there are probably better models out there that would have done a better job. Maybe if we had gone in depth into pre-processing the data, cleaning the data, dropping maybe um, features that we did not need. Maybe the model would have done better or worse. That's, I will leave to you to go and try as you have the freedom to do so. And just see if you can get a better accuracy level than the 78.89. Let's call it roughly 79%. Sri? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I think she dropped um, from the session. So what I will do, I will just continue with what we are doing. So basically, we've done, we've trained our model and we've made predictions. So on a test set. Now what we have to do left is to um, evaluate, evaluate our model. So when evaluating, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to do an out of sample prediction. So this is our data set as this illustration shows, and we have a training set and our test set, and we have um, uh, predicted the values of the test set. But now we want to see how well did the model actually do in predicting these values. So we got the accuracy. And um, so we have this, this, um, this is called a confusion matrix. So we have our actual as zero and one and our predicted also zero and one. So we have values that were actually zero and were predicted as zero. Then we have actual, uh, uh, actual values that were zero, but were predicted as one. And we had actual values that were one, but were predicted as zero. And then we have actual values that were one, that were actually predicted as one. This is just an illustration. It's not uh, necessarily from uh, from the example we've just done. So how do we calculate accuracy? Accuracy, just it's just of all the predictions, how many were actually correct? So we're taking our true positives. So our true pro positives are those ones that were one and were predicted as one, and then our true negatives. And then we're dividing by the total, total of everything. Shrey, you're back? Yeah, I think some machine crashed or something happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so absolutely accuracy. This is one of the way of calculating accuracy. If you see how many correct answers are diagonal, so true positive are people who are were having diabetes and true negative are people who are not having diabetes are on diagonal. So out of the correct answers, positive correct answer, how many positive correct answer you gave and how many from negative answer how many correct negative answer you give and how many time you misclassify that a person having diabetic, you said not having diabetic and pe people not having diabetic was predicted diabetic by this logistic regression model. So we take the correct answers irrespective of uh, diabetic or non-diabetic. We take all the correct answer, combine them together, add them together from the model and divide it by all the samples in the data. 
So for example, if the 300 patient divided by 300 in the test data, not in the training data, in the test data, so the bot denominator is all the entire training data, number of instances in training data, and numerator is the correct prediction of the model from the test data. So denominator, I'll repeat, the denominator is entire instance of test data, and numerator is the correct, correct prediction of the model on that test data, and you'll get accuracy. So, and this is called a confusion matrix. Uh, and the true positive, true negative, false positive, and false negative. This is a confusion matrix. However, there are many other methods of finding accuracy depending upon the use case, which are like area under the curve, true positive ratio, false FPR, FNR, TPR, recall, precision, F1 score. They have, they, they are list of that. So you just, if you just go to Google, uh, yeah, so here it comes. So again, recall is of all cases that are positive, how many did the model identify? So if you want to focus on people who are having diabetes, you do not you don't care that if people who do not have diabetic were told diabetic and you gave him a diabetic medicine does not have so much problem. They will not die because of that. But if people who are diabetic were told that they do not have diabetic and you did not treat them, that's much more riskier situation. So here you want to only focus or more focus on people who have diabetic is called recall. So from all the people who were having diabetic, how many uh, correct identification the model made is called recall. Okay. Similarly, precision of all the cases that model predicted to be positive, how many were actually positive? Again, you want to focus on people who are diabetic. So this is again of all the cases that model predicted to be positive were actually positive. So true positive and false positive. And the numerator is true positive. How many were positively predicted? And specificity uh, is the same thing, but for non-diabetic, which is false answer, negative results. If you want to also focus on negative results, you can check the specificity, the proportion of negative result out of number of samples that were actually negative. So you want to see the actual, <coughs> uh, what, how good your model is to predict negative result. And previous to example, we saw how good your model is to predict positive results. F measure is a weighted score between good and bad. So I'll give you a simple example. If you have 100 patient and out of which uh, two of them are diabetic and 98 of them are non-diabetic and the model predicted very, very good for non-diabetic and bad for diabetic. So all the diabetic, two people who were diabetic were both wrongly predicted and all the people who were non-diabetic were correctly predicted. The model accuracy would be very, very high despite the fact that model is useless because it did not predict people who have diabetic in the right man manner. And that is where F measures in AUC comes in. It is a weighted average or a weighted average of positive answers and negative answers and give you a better picture, uh, at, which shows that your model was not only good at negative, but is also good at positive predictions. Uh, so, Shrey, uh, what you're saying is, in real life, which metric would be the best to use, just in case you want to push this uh, a model that you're you're trying to deploy, which metric would you use? Absolutely, a very good question, uh, uh, Baraka. So, two two things which you need to see: we need to see the composition of the data. If your data is imbalanced, wherein if you have more of one kind of people and less of another kind of people. Give a simple example. If you take, if you go to a bank, most of the data will have, they will have people who have never defaulted and very less amount of data where people have defaulted. So these are all imbalanced data where the proportion of good and bad or negative or positive or zero and one is not 50-50. It is like 20-80 or 10-90. In that case, it is very important to look at F measures in AUC, 
However, if the data is sim same, like if you do an image processing, half of the image are of dogs and half of the image are of cats. When I say half, it does not have to be 50-50. It can be 55-45, similar almost. Then you can look at accuracy, recall, precision. But in real life, most of the time, in uh, cases like this, if you go to a doctor and ask, how many patients have diabetic whom you diagnose today? They'll say only 1% of patient of diabetes or 99 did not have. In such cases, please focus on F measure and AUC, not on accuracy, accuracy or any other measures. Great. So I think we can go and evaluate the model that we had um, used. So... Okay, so I'm just going to go straight to evaluating that model. That is unit five. As I mentioned, in case you're following along, you could um, follow the link that I had shown earlier, just for you to go step by step with us as we're moving along. So these are the libraries we are using. This is just basically a repeat of what we had done earlier. Mm, just cleaning the data, splitting it, and training it once more so we can evaluate it. So I'm just going to run this cell. And then we'll get our accuracy once more. And um, yeah, here, as we had stopped earlier, we had said that our accuracy was around 79%, which wasn't bad. But as Sri has explained, sometimes accuracy isn't the only metric you'd like to use, especially if you're dealing with real life data, which isn't as structured as this, um, which isn't also as little as this, but this is just for illustrative purposes. So the matrix I had shown you earlier was the confusion matrix, and we can just use con this um, here, this command conf underscore mat to get our confusion matrix based on the results that we had obtained and this is it so this is our prediction and these are the truth the actual so truth the ones that were actually one so the ones that were actually diabetic and are predicted as diabetic are 897 and then the ones that were actually diabetic but were predicted as non-diabetic are 657 that's quite a high number and then the ones that were non-diabetic and were predicted as diabetic as are 293, while the ones that are non-diabetic and were uh, predicted as non-diabetic are 2653, which is not bad. I think the model did a good job there. Yeah. And if you see this data, interestingly, people who were non-diabetic actually are in 2,800 people and people who were diabetic are around, say, how much? 1500 so in that yeah. case you may want to see f1 or some other accuracy measures and just not so it's very important to see the proportion of diabetic and non-diabetic in your actual data and then decide which metric would you like to go for yes so that's basically summarized in all these words whatever she has said so even as we mentioned we talked about our precision our recall specificity accuracy and our f measure so we're just going to run them over here we're going to combine all that using a metric set as you can see r makes your life quite easy and now it's given us all this so our ppv is just our precision and then we have recall, accuracy, and our F measure. So our accuracy was 79%. Our recall is quite low at 57.7%. And then our precision is around 75.3%. Um, and our F measure is 65.4%. Shrey, would you like to make a comment on that? Absolutely. So in this case, you would, if you see your accuracy is very high, 78%, However, your F measure is only 65 and recall is less. So these are the two factors you need to go back and check that the model. So if you go to the confusion matrix, scroll up, please. Yes. Yeah. So if you see this matrix, you will see that the uh, 
the model is not very good in predicting one and is very good in predicting the zeros, the negative answers compared to the positive answers. So your true positive uh, is only has a lot of errors uh, while your false positive has lesser amount of errors. And so you may want to change the model, change the data, retrain the model, use any other algorithm to ensure that your F measures and recall are also higher. Otherwise, you would be able, this model is very good for one kind of patient who are not negative or non-diabetic, but not equally good or similarly good for another kind of patient. Given the fact that your aim in this kind of use case is to find out people who are diabetic with more importance, because that's more important than people who are non-diabetic, you may want to rethink on how do you want to do. As Bereka told, you may want to clean the data, you may want to add, remove the data, you may want to create new features, uh, and so on and so forth. Simple example, uh, in a cancer detection uh, problem, your, your main focus is to find out who people who have cancer are detected properly that, that people who has cancer. You, uh, you, you, know, you care less about people who do not have cancer and have been detected cancer. Because even if you start a preliminary medicines for them, there'll be minor side effect. But if somebody has a cancer and the model says, this, does not, if this guy does not have cancer, you ask him to go home, he goes home, enjoys his life. After five years, he'll come with fourth, fourth stage of cancer, which is non-treatable. Thank you, Sri. So, yeah. Um, so we can now predict the class probabilities. Basically, we were just predicting whether someone could be zero or one, but now we can predict the class probabilities. That is what we are doing here and we're binding them to results. So our type now in this case will be the probability. Our data again is diabetes test. And then we're using the same logistics regression as before. And so we can get a glimpse of this data. And so we can have now whatever has been the probability of, some, of someone being predicted as one versus the probability of someone being predicted as zero. So diabetic or non-diabetic. So as you can see here, if you add this plus this, you'll get one, probabilities add to one. So basically now we're taking each instance in our test set and trying to predict what is the probability of this person being predicted as zero and what is the probability of them being predicted as one as such. Shay, would you like to add anything here? Uh, no, I guess this is the right thing. And if yeah. you want to focus on, you should focus on either one of the column, not both because you combine. Mm -hmm. So one is uh, opposite of both. So one minus 0 0.41 is 0.58. So focus on one of the columns, um, depending upon use case. So here you may want to focus on people who have diabetic and see their probability. Or you may want to focus on people who do not have diabetic and subtract that from one. Is one in the same thing. Yes. So now as... So we had mentioned uh, you can either use um, recall specific specificity um, F measure or you can use an ROC chart. So we're going to check our ROC curve here. So this is how our ROC curve, it's sensitivity against one minus specific specificity. Yes, so that is how our curve looks. And usually you would like the curve to be closer to the top left corner. And um, I think Shrey can explain a bit more about this, the IOC curve. And I'll just leave it there on display as he explains. Yeah. So when you talk about the ROC curve, that is called the rock curve, they call it. It's area under the curve. Uh, so if you see the straight diagonal line is, is when you do not have a model, this is how it looks like. The bigger the curve is, the bigger the semicircle is, the better is your model. So it is, so if you see sensitivity and specificity, and if you see the uh, formulas which Bereka showed you earlier, it, it shows you a combination of true positive and false, uh, false, sorry, the positive and the negative prediction. So bigger the AUC shows that your model is balanced and good 
to predict uh, say the positive results and the negative results so in simple word um, sensitivity and specific one minus specificity are opposite of each other and tries to show that if one goes up does the other goes down or not and bigger the curve the better it is that your model is able to balance both the scenarios thank you sir yeah so again you can also compute the auc here so we're just computing the auc here and you get an auc of around 86 percent and i think she has covered that quite well so as i mentioned earlier in case you want your model to perform better you can go back and ask yourself did i clean this data well did i pre-process it well do i need to scale my variables do i need to encode uh, my variables suppose you had um pregnant yes or no or you had another variable yes or no that was you know in uh, categorical form would you like to encode that um, some models work best when you scale your data as opposed to using them as they are because sometimes you find you have one column that has data that is ranging from 10,000 to 20,000 and then you'll find another column has data that is ranging from zero to one there's some sort of imbalance there so you have to think how can I scale this data so that there's not such a big uh, difference or there's no disproportion so that your model can train in a more efficient way Sri? absolutely and for example she told you exactly right but you may also want to combine some uh, features for example pregnancy with glucose pregnancy without glucose you want to multiply column a and column b these are called interaction features and create new features so for example if somebody has a bmi of this and was that person pregnant or not you may even combine those features multiply them together and see uh, for example if pregnancy is zero and one as Baraka told and you can have say uh, glucose level and multiply them and create one more column to see that is that adding information or not so those can also be very very useful scaling features is one again one way adding uh, adding more data can be another way adding more features can be another way or doing feature selection that out of 10 features which are the top six features which add value to your model and which are the other two or three features which are just noise you may want to take it out redo the model and see if it is working properly or not. Next way is also that you may want to shuffle your training and test data. And you instead of 70, 30, you can want to do 80, 20, or, or just change your data, mix your data again, and then uh, re-break your data into training and test and redo it. And also uh, want to check the proportion of negative and positive in your training and test data and do the, uh, do the model training again. Thank you, Shri. So for this bit, the data pre-processing, I will leave it to you, the audience, to just go and try and do it for yourself. Try and see how you can change up the data for yourself. Just as Shri mentioned, you can scale the data. You can add a new feature by multiplying. You can do whatever it is, you know, be creative with whatever it is you'd like to do. And then you can just um, continue with this part and try to run the model again. So I'll leave that here. Um, and then we can go into multi-class classification. As I can see, our time is going. So uh, when we're dealing with when we're dealing with multi-class classification models, unlike what we've done earlier, we've just categorized people into diabetic and non-diabetic, but there are different types of diabetes. There's type one, there's type two. What if you have more than two classes? You know, life is not always as simple. Even as Sri was talking about, maybe you're dealing with colors, you're trying to classify whether something is black, brown, blue, white, or whatever number of colors there are in your data set that you're dealing with. So now we'll go into multi-class classification. And um, basically it's the same thought process, but now we are increasing. So instead of zero and one, 
we'll have more. So we're dealing with square or not, as is on the slide, circle or not, triangle or not, hexagon or not. And then there could be a combination of square or circle, circle or triangle, hexagon or square. There are so many combinations that could arise from that. So now we're going to go into multi-class classification. And Sri, would you like to handle that? Sorry. So do we have time for multi-class classification or shall we take questions first? Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, then... So I can see multiple questions here. Um, yeah. So the package janitor, uh, try installing it. If it does not switch off your machine, switch it on, switch off the session, switch it on. You should be able to, uh, you know, pack it. You can actually be able to install the package. This is a question. Is there a Python alternative for tidyverse? I guess there's a Python alternative for tidyverse. Let me check. Uh, tidyverse in Python. It should be, um, I, I forgot the name, not able to recall, but they are a couple of, uh, you know, uh, it's it's not exactly, but something like pandas and others would miss com combination of couple of features would be able to give you exactly what tidyverse gives you. Tidyverse is nothing but uh, data framing or data manipulation packages. So pandas would be able to give you that. Uh, try pandas, you may have to write some functions and you'll be, you'll have a very good uh, out outcome, which is, which will be almost equivalent to tidyverse in Python. Okay. Okay. I guess uh, that's all. If somebody have more questions, please do answer. Please do ask some, any other questions which, which you have. I don't think so. There's any more questions, uh, Berka. So, do you want us to take uh, how much time we have? Seven minutes, or we have more? I think we have two minutes. Um, do we have time, Dwight? Okay. So Dwight says we have time. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So let's go to multi-class classification. Okay. Multi-class classification is exactly like binary classification. Binary, as the word says, two. So positive and negative. Multi-class is multiple classes. For example, you want to predict the color of a car. The colors can be red, blue, green, yellow, white, black. So that's multi-class. You want to predict that what is the disease somebody have from a list of diseases. Say five diseases, you want to say which disease that person have. Or you may want to find out the stage of cancer, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Again, multi-class classification. So binary talks about yes, no, true, false, and so on and so forth. While multi-class, you can expand the universe and add more aspect to it. So for example, binary would be um, will you default or not default? And multi-class would be the risk category, high risk, medium risk, low risk, no risk. So that's what is multi-class. And if you see the course packages, almost same. Uh, so we are again using tidyverse and tidy models. Uh, and if we go down and scroll down, we will run this, uh, you'll run this cell and you will see that all this package would be run, uh, would be executed. We, this package would be invoked. And these are the data which we have. Species is the species of penguin. So if you see this time, they are not two classes, but three classes uh, uh, of the penguins. If you scroll up, uh, uh, so add Adil, if you go down, it's Adil, I, I can't, chin strap and ginto. If I, I'm sorry if somebody is a penguin lover and I pronounced the species wrong. So there are three species, which means three classes. Um, island, in which island were they uh, found? Uh, there are two islands out of in which which island were they found bill length which culmin length i'm not a penguin expert or animal i'm an animal expert but it talk about the length of penguins bill in millimeters bill depth what is the depth of the bill of penguin flippers is the uh, the fins which penguins have 
what is the length of the flippers what is the mass the body weight in simple terms in grams uh, of a penguin the gender of the penguin and when was it studied which year did you study that penguin using all this you would like to predict which class does that peng penguin fall into so if i give you all this information except for species that is i give you island bill length bill depth flippers body mass sex and years you know tell me studying that data which species the penguin is out of the three species mentioned so what we'll do is we'll take all the data and uh, we will use this data to create a model which is a multi class classification model and try to create a model which can predict a pen penguin species given other data so yes, let's run the first two so this is how the data look like i will not go into the depth and then let's go to the next one we have seen this where i explained it properly and yeah this is to see that is there any missing value uh, there is no missing value so we are good to go we don't need any missing value imputation or preprocessing to fill the missing values the data is complete in itself okay okay and this one so yeah it says drop any if any any data is not available just drop those data and we found out that edily uh, there's 151 examples of edily chinstrap you have 68 example and gain 2 you have 123 example again if you see the data is not balanced uh, one of the species uh, or two species are in high numbers while one species in less number so please make sure you see which metric to use uh, judiciously before going blindly uh, and using uh, any metric yeah so here what we do we'll create a plot so the plot is a box plot which shows um, yeah which shows four different features uh, and how do this feature perform in species so edily uh, the okay the feature which is called bill depth is high for edily and very very low for gento while bill length is very low the length of the bill is very low in species called edily and high in chinstrap and gento are large i think so their bill are larger compared to bills of edily and similarly if you see flipper length uh, is the maximum lot the length of the flipper is maximum or very very longer for ginto compared to edily and chinstrap so this gives you a very high level understanding of what uh, what to see in the data before you predict something and machine you also see these kind of patterns when it tries to predict something and or predict this three predict this three species okay uh, so this is the same thing mentioned here so we'll not do let's prepare the data okay yeah so same thing which baraka did last time split the data into 70 30 70 for your training 32 test and and that's it we will just run this so uh, training we have 238 example of training data and 104 example of test data because 70 is to 30 that's the ratio and if you go down i will train a multi class classifier so that was called logistic regression it is called multinomial regression because multiple classes so multinomial regression so n net is uh, is the engine name and classification we are doing we will fit a multi class regression and species uh, tilde dot dot means take ev all the other features except species for understanding the pattern which is your independent features and the data would be penguin training data and we'll fit fit the model so we have fitted the model ran, ran the code and if you scroll down you'll see um you'll see the values similarly the way you saw it for uh logistic regression interestingly you will see you have chin chinstrap and gento you don't have edily now interestingly why you don't have edily because edily is my benchmark right so you will compare everything with uh edily so if you increase the bill length by 
uh, 1.39 oh, sorry if you increase the bill length by one unit the chances of somebody falling into edily is changes by 1.39 percent right similarly if you increase the bill length by one millimeter uh, the chances of somebody falling into from gentoo to edily increases by 23 percent so everything is compared with edily so here edily becomes default and you need to compare chin strap with edily and ginto with edily now why a day become default it's alphabetical order so Ed edily starts with a so it becomes default and chin strap and ginto um, are the two other thing which you need to compare so you if you want to see what are the chances of somebody falling into chin strap compared to edily uh, the numbers or the values next to chin strap in the row would be something which you would like to see. Okay, let's go down. Okay, this is the first five, I guess. Yeah, first five uh, columns in the test data wherein <clears throat> the species were ideally, were predicted ideally, and where. Yeah, yeah. Species were ideally, the predicted class were ideally, the, the predicted probability was 99%. So with high surety, you know that's an ideally. Same goes for and 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 so since it's 99%, very, very high surety, the prediction probability for Ginto and Chin Strap would of course be very, very low. Right. So very, very good result for the first five call rows. All ideallys were predicted as ideally. So it looks like a good model, but we'll go ahead and see the confusion matrix. Confusion matrix would give us a better idea. The confusion matrix would be same, but here this time it will be three by three instead of two by two. So if you see Edily, um, so if you see the diagonal, I guess the diagonal shows that almost all were predicted absolutely correct except, except for one 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 per one penguin who was chin straps was and was predicted as edily and everybody or, or not every all other penguins uh were predicted exactly uh the class they fall a species they fall into so it's a very good model almost should be 90 percent accuracy let's see you can total it up should be 95 percent accuracy so yeah similar thing only one mistake and everything is very, very nice. So 46 plus 20 plus 37 is your accuracy out divided by 46 plus 20 plus 37 plus one. Out of total instances, the accuracy is very, very high. So it's a very good model, nice prediction, nice data. So it's everything seems, uh, seems perfect. Let's see the accuracy. So again, accuracy is 99%, sensitivity is 98%, specificity is 99%, uh, balanced accuracy is 98%, pre precision is 99%, recall is 98% because of one mistake. And F measure, which I told is very, very important, is also 98%. So yes, this is a very, very good model. And if you see the ROC curve, I should, the ROC curve, you can see the curve is very very so if you see it's almost 100 percent so the curve is almost touching uh, the lines and all the three lines are there but that has merged under each other so you can only see one line but all the three lines are there behind each other so every all the three species or all the three species has been predicted perfectly here right so, Shrey, do you want us to go into support vector machines or... Yeah, so, can... support vector machine is another algorithm. I'll not go into mathematics of support vector machine. It is an algorithm uh, which helps you understand nonlinear trends between models. However, your this model was itself 98% accurate. So, we'll just keep running this model. Uh, let's not go deep dive into this this uh, long so it's another algorithm support vector machine so if you go down uh, so svm is uh, what is support vector machine is so all this model have a linear boundary so the straight line 
in any any direction says straight line either you fall this side of the line or this side of the line support vector machine you can have a curve a circle any kind of decision boundary and you can fall on any side so it's not linear but it's non linear life is non linear so people do use non linear thing so if you see um and again it's complicated because you have to tune the hyperparameters there are a lot of parameters which goes in unlike logistic regression uh, uh so again we are sampling the data we are bootstrapping the data so 10 times we have sampled the data this machine uh, this example would run 10 times and will give you a more holistic answer or more uh, yeah more stronger answer what does parallel do parallel make sure that the machine all the cores of the machine works in parallel to each other so you save time and utilize the entire machine properly so we are uh, running the, uh, the svm we are tuning the svm it will should take some time let's go up and see the tune grid if we have more up uh, do we have it somewhere okay these are the parameters yeah uh, level 6 6 6 level means uh, the more levels you have the more complex would be the model to make the model better but i guess now the it should have run by now so yeah, and, and awesome this is done now yeah this is still running will take couple of more minutes because again you are tuning the model you are passing multiple parameters the the model is iterating multiple times would be running 10 times uh, so it should take 2 minutes or so so in meanwhile if somebody have questions uh, you can talk about that but yes as most in real life example these are very very oh it is done these are very very important model so again uh, rbf is a parameter estimator mean standard deviation these are parameters so if you have to know more about support vector machine try reading you'll understand what are these parameters and if you see your uh, results again uh, these are graphical representation talking about how does the result look like so if you see uh, the two um, what we say the yellow and green lines so that rbf sigma which are very very high uh, for two classes and may not be very very high for other sigma values rbf sigma is a parameters so you may would like to choose uh, one or 0.01 sigma values uh, which are better compared to other sigma values and if you go down yeah let's see the accuracy i think so it should be very very good again 100% accuracy for uh, not 97 98% accuracy uh, for most of the sigma values and you may so now you have uh, you know ran the model using multiple sigma values now for the next time you can finalize one sigma value and only use that sigma value which gives you better best answer and uh, run the model the cost is 32 the best sigma value is one you use one as a sigma value and run the model again it will be faster and better you don't have to experiment you don't have to tune the model you already know the answer and the last fit is use your training data to fit the model okay so multi class 97% um yeah uh, and 99% good roc which is 99% and accuracy is 97% is as good as the previous model but i think so bit better no this is worse than the previous model the previous was right a uh, better because there are three mistakes this model has done compared to only one mistake that previous model has done so concluding that complex model are not always better a simple model in this case perform better than a complex algorithm so uh, always stating that the complex model are better is not true sometimes simple model gives you much far better result than complex model so i think so this oh we only have one more cell okay sure 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 i think this is done yeah this is uh, done yeah we have run yeah everything yeah. so now we can deal with any questions that are there yes we can deal with questions or we can wrap up
So, Shrey, have you used classification models in any of the real-life work that you do? Oh, yes. I work for a lot of financial services company. So, we have used a lot of classification uh, models. And we have used binary classification mostly to predict that will a person default or not? Will, it, will that person give the loan or not? Will pay back the money or not? And mostly we have used logistic regression, random forest, those kind of uh, models. They are very, very uh, strong. Logistic regression, why? Because simple people who are not from technical background understand logistic regression simply because you just showed how simple is logistic regression. And uh, people who are, and when you want a very, very strong model, you may want like to use different kind of algorithms like random forest, support vector machine, gradient boosting, neural network, and so on and so forth. So in most of your work, do you mostly use the complex models or the simpler models? Simple model, um, because most of the time, simple model solves the problem. Even if we use a complex model and the accuracy changes by 1% or very less, we go back to simple model. That does not matter so much. Okay. So somebody asked, what is the difference, similarity and difference between logistic and linear regression? A uh, lot of similarity. The difference is logistic regression is for classification, where you choose between A or B, true or false, yes or no. And linear regression is continuous data, which is like if you have to predict how much loan you should give to somebody, it will be linear regression because it's an amount, $2,000 or $2,021. But if you have to choose, should you give loan to somebody or not, which is true and false, logistic regression. Concert, if I have answered you. OK. Uh, any other questions before we close the day? OK. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, it was nice interacting with you all. Thank you, Bereka. Thank you, Microsoft. And thank you all for your time. See you. Bye. Thank you. So thank you for joining us. Have a good evening, a good afternoon, a good morning, depending on where you are.